the most important person in the room is your training partner. And that, because they are the person that helps you grow. Welcome to Whistle Keg Martial Arts Radio, episode 182. Thanks for dropping in. Today, we're going to hear from Coach Mike Chen, someone who exemplifies living a martial arts lifestyle. Here at Whistlekick, we make the world's best sparring gear, and on Martial Arts Radio, we bring you the best podcast on the traditional martial arts twice every week. Welcome. My name is Jeremy Lesniak, and I'm your host, as well as the founder of Whistlekick Sparring Gear and Apparel. Thank you to the returning listeners, and welcome to those of you tuning in for the first time. You can find our show notes at whistlekickmartialartsradio.com, which is also the easiest place to sign up for our great newsletter. As a thank you for joining, we're going to send you our top 10 tips for martial artists, which is an exclusive never before aired, never will be aired podcast episode. Our newsletter keeps you up to date on what's going on here at Whistlekick, upcoming show guests, and even discounts on products. You know, we've put a lot of work into our martial arts calendar website. It's available at martialartscalendar.com. And that's a free place for you to post martial arts competitions, seminars, charitable events, promotions, anything else that might be of interest to other martial artists. It is and always will be free to use and post to. Help us add to it, and let's grow the martial arts together. Coach Mike Chen comes to us from a listener introduction, and I'm glad that we received it. As we hear him tell his tale of martial arts, we hear someone who found their destiny, lives a martial arts lifestyle, and fully embraces what that means. We get into some deep conversations, and he doesn't hold back. I enjoyed his perspective and openness to the things we discussed, and I hope you enjoy listening to our conversation. Let's welcome him. Coach Chen, welcome to Whistlekick Martial Arts Radio. Oh, I'm, I'm very honored to be here. Thank you very much. Good morning, Jeremy. Thank you. Good morning. Well, thanks for being here. You know, it's it's a good day. You fall into that that category of folks that geographically aren't that far away. I could be where you're at in a little under three hours, which for those of you that are not from New England, three hours is, is a uh, not a far drive. That's right. Right around the corner. <laughs> That's right. And, and we have a saying in Vermont that if it's less than an hour, you know, it, it doesn't even really warrant uh, – explaining how far away something is it's you know because it's vermont and everything's an hour and you start to get out of vermont and and that kind of continues until you get into you know new york city and what an hour there is about a mile and a half so that's right absolutely <laughs> one spent four hours going through new york it was awful so yeah yeah not um i spent a little bit of time in in northern virginia and if you load up the gps it said 20 minutes and it was like two miles. That's right. Thinking. I'm I'm actually originally from Loudoun County in Northern Virginia, so I'm very familiar with the Northern Virginia traffic as well. Any any drive that I can run faster than the car, I'm not cool with. That's that's, that's right. That's over that's my right. threshold. <laughs> Absolutely. Okay. Well, we're not here to talk about New England driving. We're not here to talk about urban driving. We're here to talk about martial arts, of course. And we have you on to talk about you and your past and, and where you're going and tell some stories and all that. You know that. Listeners know that. So we got to start by understanding a little bit about who you are. Easiest way to sure. do that. Tell us how you got started in the martial arts. Absolutely. Um, it's a funny story. I had a roommate in college. I went to the University of Tennessee down in Knoxville, Tennessee. And a roommate in college, his name's Dustin Fulton. He was a uh, judo uh, judoka. And he invited me to go and train one day. I think I was 20 years old, just about 21. So this is back in 2006, 2007 time. And uh, invited me to go train with uh, a guy that we knew who was an amateur MMA fighter, soon to turn pro. And it was a premier martial arts. And uh, that's was the school's owned by Barry Vanover in Knoxville. And uh, I got to train under Josh Kate and Josh Kate is a fourth degree black belt now under, uh, started under Helio Seneca and ultimately got his black belt from Hermes Franca. That's before Hermes went to prison. Um, and, uh, we learned, I, I got to try the class and fell in love with it. It was a traditional, I mean, there was a traditional martial arts school, did a lot of karate, um, but they offered wrestling, Muay Thai, Brazilian Jiu Jitsu. And, I just really got into it. I mean, after the first class, I couldn't get enough of it. Really enjoyed the competition. You know, I played traditional sports, football, basketball, baseball all my life. And I missed the contact of football and, you know, getting punched in the face by a roundhouse kick or getting punched or getting a roundhouse kick is uh, 
gave you the same uh, same thrill as getting lit up on the football field. So I really I really enjoyed it. I fell in love with it and haven't I haven't stopped. So um, it's been it's been a great ride so far. I think there's a a lot of us that you know we find the intensity of martial arts, especially if you grew up, as you said, playing traditional sports, football, and and that contact, and I, not just the contact, but the training for something. You know, it seems to be a, a common thread among a lot a lot of martial artists that start. You know, I don't I don't want to offend you and say later in life because you're, you're not exactly old, but you know, there you started later than a lot of the guests that we've had on. Oh, absolutely, and I think that that went to the simple fact that. I didn't have the discipline. I didn't have the the regiment to uh, to do a, a martial arts when I was a kid. I was I, I was a wild kid. I couldn't I couldn't sit through a class. I just didn't have the attention span. That's really, in football and you know and basketball. I mean, heck, even those things really I had a difficult time holding my attention. But you know, you had a coach to always grab you by the face mask and bring you back to attention. Uh, my biggest regret in life, and especially my martial arts career and 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 life, is that I never did wrestling. Um, I really enjoy the sport of wrestling, and I think that helps in so many different facets facets of my journey down martial arts, whether it be Brazilian Jiu Jitsu, No Gi Jiu Jitsu, you know, even Muay Thai with the takedowns and uh, you know the, all that stuff. I think that that's one thing I wish I had done as a kid, but. Yeah, I got a late start in life. I never really paid it any mind, you know, and it, a lot of stuff goes to what are your friends doing? I had one friend who um, was a traditional martial artist, did all kinds of forms, karate, um, got to compete in Germany. His name's Connor Mullaney. He tr- competed when he was a kid along with uh, several others from our area. Um, so that was, a uh, you know, it, it, he, he did a lot of that. We always kind of were, you know, there was a mystery. Uh, about martial arts that you know a lot of us didn't get i mean i grew up in a town of 500 um, in round hill virginia so the martial arts schools uh, around us as you referred to earlier of uh, distances was not close i mean it was similar to kind of you know it was an hour drive one way and you know it's kind of one of those things that you you get to do what your parents are able to drive you to and football, they had buses and basketball, the same thing. So I was, I just relied on what the schools offered. So, but yeah, it's been, it's, I, I can't say enough about where I started off in, in Knoxville. It was a, it was awesome. It was a great time in my life at that point. Cool. Now I'm curious because when your friend invited you to come to this class, you know, may, maybe, maybe there was some apprehension or something, but you're not expressing that. What was it? that he said that got you to go. How did he, how did he present that? Cause, and, and I asked, I asked that because a lot of us are trying to get our friends to come to martial arts classes. So what worked for you? Well, I mean, I can tell you that I had been sitting on the couch watching WEC, uh, you know, in the early days for, you know, gosh, you know, a year or two before I tried my first class and have been watching the UFC and, you know, new, I mean, I remember watching, Going to the video store, and I, I don't know how much this dates me, but going to Blockbuster and, you know, picking up the original UFC 1s and 2s and, and seeing all that stuff. And, you know, it, it was kind of a dream because, like, you know, it wasn't mainstream like it is now. So you just didn't have any idea of where to try to pick something like that up or try to, you know, work that in to your life. And, and my, my buddy Dustin just said, hey, um, come try it out. Of course, I was nervous. I think one of the biggest things that I always tell people when I'm talking to them about my martial arts career and get them to come to our school um, and conquer chaos martial arts is, is that um, is that the hardest thing you're ever going to have to do in your martial arts career is step onto the mats for your first time and put on that white belt. I mean, that is it is by far the hardest thing you'll ever have to do. It is something that I can't say enough about, and it takes a ton of courage. And, you know, I went with someone who I was very close to and who I had a lot of faith in that he wasn't going to set me up for failure. And, uh, yeah, I mean, I just, I, it just so happened that the class that we took was there was a few other people who was there first time. So, you know, you kind of just sit in quiet silence and kind of watch what other people are doing and try to mimic them, you know, when you're stretching out. But, 
Yeah, I mean, I, to say that I was nervous is a understatement. I thought about throwing up a couple times um, just because, I mean, it, it's overwhelming. It's it, When you hear, oh, you know, we're going to go do a, you know, this class and that class. And ultimately, it's, you know, referred to now as, as MMA or mixed martial arts. I, I was I, I was scared out of my mind. I thought I was going to walk in there and, you know, there's going to be some 300-pound tattooed guy just comes up and he goes me and you we're gonna fight right now and just be like i i have no idea what i'm getting myself into but it's nothing like that i mean it, it's uh, i think that's one thing that i really have enjoyed in watching the evolution um of mma whether it be bellator or um, the ufc or you know any of the you know smaller regional stuff like for example around here cage titans ces down in rhode island um, and you know, our, the local show here in Manchester combat zone. I mean, you go to these fights and it, there's such a respect and, and, and an understanding of the, of the general public now versus, you know, 10, 11 years ago when people just thought about, thought of it as a barbaric. When I first started out in Tennessee at that time, it was still illegal to have, um, MMA fights, whether it be amateur or professional. It was not allowed in Tennessee until 2008, I believe, is when the Tennessee legislature actually passed the bill allowing for MMA. And so I just think that it was it's funny to think back now of how I first perceived it to now seeing it how the general public is able to perceive it. I mean, don't get me wrong, there's still people who think it's barbaric, but at the same time, those people generally don't have a full understanding of what's going on. So, yeah. You know, one of the things I like to talk about is, is this very subject of people starting martial arts later in life. Because for those of us that have been training all of our lives, and quite often the folks that have martial arts schools have been training for most of their life, all of their life, you know, a, a long amount of time. It's easy to forget what it's like to be the new student coming in to have that anxiety about starting something that you really don't have any context for. And there's a couple things that you mentioned that make that easier that I just want to underscore for the school owners or, or the people that are running schools out there. You went in with a friend and you weren't the only new student. And those two things lead to so much more retention in martial arts. And why do I care about retention? Because of my personal belief that the world's a better place when we're all training. I've talked about that on the show and I don't know if you would agree, Coach Chen, but. Oh yeah, okay. I, I definitely, I, I think that, I mean, it changes your life. I mean, we offer, <clears throat> we offer certain programs for certain students who are, you know, having, we offer, I should say a little bit extra for some people um, who need that little extra push. Um, you know, either kids who are having a tough time at home or, you know, adults who are going through a tough time in their own personal life. I mean, we offer that sanctuary. I think that's, I think that's, that's to me, that's what, you know, MMA or training in general, you know, Brazilian Jiu Jitsu, whether it be a competition or going to a different school and going to, to a different seminar or it, every, everywhere I go, when I walk into a gym, that's my sanctuary. That's where I feel most at home. And I think that that, what you're talking about of bringing a friend, I mean, People don't get that at first, but if you really think about it, I mean, this is a place where you can ultimately be yourself. It shows you who you are. It reveals oneself in the most um, internal way, and you don't realize that until you go and try it out. And, and I've never been to a gym or a dojo or any place that I, I've ever trained at, whether you know I've been down to Braintree under crew Mark DeGrone. Um, or <clears throat> up to, you know, the Vermont Open by you guys up in Burlington with Julio Foca Fernandez. And, you know, every time you walk into those places, you, you, you just feel that energy where everyone is, it's a camaraderie and it's a brotherhood, it's a sisterhood. And it fosters such awesome relationships that you just can't, it's definitely not a work relationship. I'll tell you that. You know, you go to work and you're like, hey, you know, Marge, how's uh, <clears throat> how's your kids? And they're like, oh, it's great. And it's small talk. It's, you know, you you go to these gyms and I mean, you bleed together, you sweat together, you 
you learn together and you grow as people together. And it's just something you, it's, it's indescribable. And, you know, being, like I said, being a new student and getting to see other students with me, grow with me in the next few years I trained there. I mean, it's, it's, it's just awesome. And, and it goes to what you're talking about retention. It's, and if you try it and you give yourself a, sh- give it a chance, you won't regret it ever. I don't, I don't think I, I can't imagine my life without martial arts and that, and that first day I stepped on the mats. Wow. Yeah. Some of the most poignant statements we've had on the show right there, it was jotting down notes. Cause you know, we put quotes in at the beginning of the show and on the show notes page and you just gave me like four or five of them in, in the last couple of minutes. So cool. <laughs> but as you're talking, I had a thought that I don't think I've ever had before. And I'm curious if you would agree. There almost seems to be, as you're talking about it, as I'm reflecting on conversations I've had with others, there seems to be like there may be a greater bond between those that train grappling versus those of us, you know, including myself, who are primarily striking or stand-up folks. It, would you agree? Is there there's some kind of intimacy that builds these stronger bonds when you've got your training partners laying on top of you? I mean, for me, yes. I mean, I think that, but at the same time, I've been training Muay Thai just as long as I've been doing Brazilian Jiu Jitsu. And, you know, Muay Thai, I mean, you, you watch people who can't throw uh, a jab cross, you know, hook, you know, when they first start out and get to see that development and you encourage each other because, I mean, it can be frustrating, you know, learning to open up your hips just as, you know, learning how to throw a jab cross and, Almost every single martial arts across the board, whether it be karate, taekwondo, you know, like you said, Kempo, uh, when we were talking earlier, um, you know, geez, I mean, just about I mean, Krav Maga, I mean, a- anything, just throwing those, that basic combination, when you first get it, you, you see it so often that you don't really think anything of it, and then you try, and you, you look, you, you know, I know I looked foolish the first time I did it. And I thought, oh, you know, I'm, you know, I can do whatever I want. I'm invincible. I'm 20 years old. Nothing, you know, nothing can stop me. But at the same time, then you learn that you're you're doing, you've been doing it all wrong. And so, you know, I think that, yes, I think that, you know, obviously to, uh, to use your word, intimacy is definitely you, there's a closeness of choking your teammates unconscious. I mean, you don't ever get to that point, but, you know, the trust factor of, you know, Muay Thai, you you trust when you're sparring and the same thing in karate and and Taekwondo and, you know, Jeet Kune Do and like, you know, all all kinds of different martial arts that, you know, you have points fighting and sparring, open sparring, that you trust your partner is not going to hurt you, that that's not the point. The point is to work techniques that you've learned and integrate them into a more – I don't want to say real world, but more fast paced, more, um, there's a lot more going on and it's definitely a higher level of thinking versus just, you know, doing your traditional, uh, or excuse me, not traditional, but your, your standard, you know, working your techniques. I think in Brazilian Jiu Jitsu, I mean, specifically you're taught to, you know, incapacitate a person. I mean, you are, you know, if you go back to, you know, um, you know, the original start of, you know, judo coming over here and then, you know, going to the Gracie's and the Gracie's school, you know, kind of the Gracie's kind of spreading it to, you know, I think where the biggest boom has been is the United States, obviously Brazil, you know, you have a ton of amazing competitors and, you know, Brazilian Jiu Jitsu black belts. But I think that the idea is that you are a smaller guy um, you know, it's called a gentle art. I mean, you're a smaller guy versus a bigger guy. And the idea is to break their arm, break their leg, break their shoulder, choke them unconscious. Um, you know, I, I think one of my favorite quotes from, uh, Brazilian Jiu Jitsu is that, you know, a person, you can break a person's arm, I'm not paraphrasing now. Um, you break a person's arm or you break a person's leg. I mean, and they could be a tough guy and get through it, but there are no tough guys for chokes. I mean, you're going unconscious. Right. And so, but I think that, you know, like you said, the intimacy is that I trust my partners or my training partners, my teammates, <clears throat> that if I am trying to be a tough guy and you know, this is more towards, you know, I think it was more towards I used to do when I was a white belt because I didn't want to lose and I didn't look at it the right way. 
And I, you know, a lot of white belts in Brazilian, Brazilian Jiu Jitsu look at it this way is that they don't want to lose that, you know, it's not losing, it's a learning experience. And so I would, I would hold out on like arm bars or I would hold out on Kimura lock, which is a shoulder lock and, and, and your, 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 your higher belts, purple belts, brown belts, black belts, even, you know, high level blue belts, they're not going to finish that move to hurt you. They're going to say, okay, I've got it. Let's move on, you know, because they know it's not about winning and losing. It's just about working your techniques and helping each other grow. Um, so I think that there is a trust there that, you know, and obviously if you're unconscious, they want to let you go. That'd be fantastic. I always appreciate when my partners let me go if I'm, if I, if I've fallen unconscious, it's very nice of them. But, uh, it's, uh, yeah, I, I think that it, it, it is a closeness. And, and I mean, the same thing, if you watch, um, if you see those who wrestled either, um, in high school collegiately or, you know, in the Olympic circuit, I mean, you, you see a very, there's, there's an, uns, there's a bond that you just can't, uh, you just can't replace it. You just can't have, it just doesn't, you know, the blood, sweat and tears that went into where you are. I think one of the biggest things that you saw publicly, if you are, you know, like me, a huge UFC fan is that you saw Patrick Cummins and Daniel Cormier, you know, these guys are teammates in college, wrestling teammates. And, you know, Patrick Cummins broke the unspoken rule, which is you don't talk about what happens in the training room. And you don't go around bragging what you did inside the training room because that's not the purpose of the training room. And I think that that's something that, you know, you have to respect in uh, that I get out of Brazilian Jiu Jitsu. Um, and it's taught by, you know, every almost every single <clears throat> I've had three instructors um, that I've been under because I've moved from Knoxville, where I started my career, to Phoenix, Arizona, where I went to law school. And I uh, got to train at Gracie, Arizona under Nathan Ziegler and uh, Greg Holmes and, um, you know, the guys over there and, uh, you know, it, it, and Doug Moore, you know, three amazing black belts under um, under Helsin Gracie. And then finally landed in Concord, where I I've, I've, think I've grown the most as a person and as a martial artist um, under John Sanders. I mean, he is an incredible instructor. He's a second degree black belt under um, Rodrigo Medeiros out of who's a, from, uh, who's one of the Carlson Gracie elite team members back in the day. I mean, the guy just, just won the Pan American games. Um, he's five time Pan Am, Pan Am champ, um, at black belt. I mean, he is, he's multi time world's masters champion. I mean, the, the guy's, the guy's incredible. I and mean, I've got to meet him and learn under him, but I mean, it's just, it's your coaches foster, the environment and uh, your professors and foster that environment of trust. And I think in going back, coming full circle, not to just keep rambling, uh, but to come full circle is I think that, you know, having, I don't have the traditional martial arts to compare it to. I don't know what a karate dojo looks like on the inside as far as, you know, day-to-day -day training. But I know that, you know, having seen what my teaching Muay Thai myself and, teaching or, and then learning Brazilian Jiu Jitsu and learning Muay Thai is that you see people who are complete strangers on all walks of life, complete strangers. These are adults, the same as me who started later in life, probably maybe, or are coming from, you know, a, a, what you, what Americans would con consider a traditional martial arts like karate or Taekwondo and coming over and trying this new martial arts in their life and trying to expand their base is that you see these adults who are from all walks of life, like I said, that come together and they encourage each other. I mean, they don't know each other from Adam, but they see each other trying. They see each other really focusing on becoming better because of the each the most important. One of my another favorite quote of mine is the most important person in the room is your training partner, and that because they are the person that helps you grow. And you know that's it's I think it's great. I mean. Well, one of the things about Brazilian Jiu Jitsu that you that you don't really have in um, most stand up martial arts is that it's really tough to do a uh, to do a lot of sweeps and different techniques in Brazilian Jiu Jitsu by yourself. You got to have another person. There's got to be another person to you know essentially work. I mean, you know there is no there is no heavy bag for doing a scissor sweep. 
or doing a Bravo joke or, you know, or, you know, any of the, or flower sweeper, you know, taking the back. I mean, those grappling dummies can only do so much for you. So you need an actual live human being. And I mean, that's, again, goes to camaraderie and, you know, f- you know, uh, relationships that you just don't get. Um, and it's definitely, uh, my, my neighbor asked me one day, uh, I was a Saturday morning, I was getting up and I was, you know, wearing my, uh, wearing some, you know, what looked like workout clothes. And then I have my gi in my, in my bag. And he said, Oh yeah, where are you going? And I said, Oh, I'm going to train. And I was like, I just left my beautiful wife to go roll around with a bunch of sweaty guys. So, I mean, you know, it, you know, it, it's a sacrifice you make, but I mean, I can't, I, I love it. So. Right on. Let's talk about stories. Sure. We wandered in and out on that. It was great. I think we've got a pretty good sense of who you are. In fact, better than most by the time we come through this point in our conversation. So I want to thank you for that. I want to thank you for being so open. Martial arts, of course, lends itself to some dramatic things, dramatically good, dramatically bad, quite often exciting. I'd like you to take a moment and tell us your best martial arts story. It was funny. I was was thinking about this last night, and I think that um, those who were there will remember this fondly. And I remember this was – so as I said before, um, I started training in Tennessee, and I wanted to be an amateur fighter. And I actually found out I was going to be an amateur fighter. When uh, uh, Professor Kate came up to me and said to me, hey, you want to do this whole fighting thing, right? And I was like, yeah, sure. And he goes, okay, great. You have a fight coming up in a month. And I was like, oh, my God, you know, like this is happening. And I got through that fight just fine. We, we, were, we went out to North Carolina and it was a smokers. Um, and we went out there and fought a guy and choked, you know, was, was fortunate enough to be able to take him down, use my jujitsu and got a uh, submission and, you know, pretty quickly got to run out of the ring and go back. And it was funny. It, it was, it was so little that, um, they made us wear headgear if you were in the smokers and we were sharing headgear between like five or six guys. And I think I was the third guy. So, I mean, it was, it was just sweaty enough where it didn't smell yet, but I know that by the end it was terrible. But uh, I think the best story I have is uh, my second fight was in Corbin, Kentucky. And for those who don't know, which is uh, I would say 99% of the world don't know where Corbin, Kentucky is. It's about an hour and a half north of Knoxville, Tennessee. It's a very small uh, town and beautiful place. I mean, southern Kentucky is absolutely gorgeous. Um, and southeastern eastern Kentucky to be, it, it, just in general. Um, but so we, we drive up to Corbin, Kentucky. There is, we had a train of us. Uh, so there's probably 10 of us all doing the, uh, the last minute, uh, cut as we sometimes did, which was turn the heat all the way up in the car, you know, in a, on a summer day, everyone's wearing their sweats and you put, you pop now and laters in your mouth and you spit into a bottle. I mean, you lose a couple pounds and you're ready to go by the time you get there. It's, it's a makeshift sauna. So I remember I drove up there um, and, you know, specifically with a, a, a real good friend of mine. His name's Travis. And I mean, I couldn't I can't name all the people that were there were, that we were that were fighting that night. Cause, I mean, there were so many because um, we, we traveled as a team, much like, you know, you have, you know, you know, any type of competition team. We went together. And so we get to the weigh-ins this is all amateur fights. So day of day of weigh-ins, there's no 24 hour, you know, rehydration type of deal, uh, with amateur fights at this point. And I get to the weigh-ins, I get on the scale and weigh in at 156, and then a, at a, a lightweight fight, um, you know, just a little bit about, I'm about six feet tall, uh, maybe a little bit more. And at that point probably weighed, you know, was fluctuating between weights of 170 to 180, you know, now, uh, life has caught up to me. Um, um, I've, I, like I said, I have, I have a newborn daughter, so I'm about w- between 180 and 190 light, lightweight's a little bit of a stretch now. Um, but that's, uh, I remember getting there weighing in at 156, and the promoter, um, comes up to me and says, um, unfortunately your opponent who you were slated to fight was unable to make weight. Um, and he weighed in at about 171 do you want to still, uh, you know, fight him? And I was like, Oh, absolutely. I didn't put in all this work not to fight. So I put my sweats back on and 
um, and stood on the scale. And I think I got up to like 166 or something. Everybody was like 160, uh, somewhere around there, just so when they called the official weight, that didn't look like I was just like, you know, the scarecrow of a guy. Um, and I remember we, we, we weighed in and we all had a good laugh and, you know, you know, people were like, oh, you should be angry. And it's like, well, whatever. It is what it is. Um, there's nothing to do about it. And so the best part about it is that, and this is kind of where the, the best story comes in, is that we have, you know, eight guys who are fighting and we had, you know, three or four guys who are just, you know, there to hold pads, wrap hands, you know, support the team, you know, that type of thing. And so you have, you know, these 10, 11 guys. And so we go have food at this small local diner. And, and you know, these guys haven't seen 11, a party of 11 roll in probably in, you know, I don't know, years, if ever. Um, where it's a small diner and we take over like a whole wing of it and we're sitting there and, you know, loud rambunctious fighters. And, you know, you see all the old, old timers sitting at the counter, look up for their coffee, staring at us. And we decided, okay, what are we going to do? We've got about three hours to kill before we have to start getting ready. And one of our guys says, yo, let's go, see, let's go to the movies. So we went to a movie cause I mean, that's relaxing. So if you're tired, if you need to rehydrate, you can drink water in the movies. It's dark. You know, you can close your eyes, you can, you know, you're relaxed. So you have 11 guys all, you know, full of piss and vinegar. And we go see the movie, and I'll remember this to this day, is that we had 11 guys sitting in a row watching the rom- romantic comedy starring um, Kate Hudson and Matthew McConaughey, Fool's Gold. And I'll tell you, that's not exactly the typical uh, movie that you watch before a fight. So, I mean, I remember that, and I, I, I still laugh about it. I think it's hilarious. Um, that, you know, you have a bunch of guys who are getting ready to, you know, essentially put themselves out there and fight, you know, bleed. And they're watching a romantic comedy about misadventures in the Caribbean. Um, and so uh, and, I, and, I, and another thing I remember is that after we leave the movie, um, we get to the venue, which is uh, social hall slash church slash, you know, um, you know, community center type of deal. And, you know, a couple of my friends had come up uh, from school or from from Knoxville for, from school. And, you know, I mean, you, we, they, my friends grow, you know, in college are the same as everyone's friends in college that, you know, they like to party and they get there. And one thing that you have that if you've never lived in the southeast that you'll learn is that there are these things called dry counties and dry counties means no alcohol sold in the county. And you cannot sell them unless it's at a sanctioned bar, which are very, very, very few and far between. So my, you know, I've got, you know, probably 10, 15 guys that, and, and, and girls that came up to watch the fights. And they say, yeah, you know, where's, where's the beer cart? You know, where, where's the concession stand that's selling Coors Light? And you know, I'm like, ah, they don't sell alcohol here. And they're like, well, where can we get alcohol? And I asked, you know, the local promoter, they're like, oh, about 55 miles to the north and they're like well this is awful and so you know i i found it funny because i mean these you know these guys came here with the expect expectation of you know like kind of you know going to vegas or the madison square garden where you have some cocktail waitress bringing you bringing you drinks obviously that's was not the case um and uh but yeah so we warmed up and you know uh Got into, got to the fight and, you know, it was, it was a good time. I was, I was again, fortunate enough to win and, uh, won by second round TKO guy was real tough, you know, tough country kid. And, um, and it was fun. And I, I, I think that was the reason that's, I would say that's my most fond memory is just, uh, it goes back to that whole brotherhood sisterhood thing is that, you know, you don't, I can't tell you the last time I went with, you know, a couple of friends, you know, a couple of guy friends and said, Hey, you know, you want to go see a romantic comedy, but here I am with, you know, 10 other guys that, you know, we've been training and we think we're, you know, super badasses and we're sitting there watching a romantic comedy and you're right before a fight. I mean, nonetheless. So that's the, that's the, that's the, that's the memory that sticks out most in my mind. Um, it was definitely a, a, one of my fonder memories. I mean, that, that's camaraderie right there. And I don't know if I'm supposed to talk about it either. So there you go. So if anybody's listening to this, I'm sorry, I, I outed you guys. So <laughs> you kind of run the gamut with that story, talking about the training and, and the behind the scenes and giving us some humor and some nerves and, you know, the other guy not making weight and all this other stuff. I mean, that's, 
that kind of encapsulates everything in, in one anecdote. So thank you for sharing that. Obviously, martial arts is a deep pursuit for you. It, it's, I don't know if I want to say all encompassing, but it, it sounds like if not, it's pretty close. Oh, I would 100% agree with okay. that. Yeah, absolutely. I think that it, it touches every facet of my life. Do you have time for or interest in anything else? Do you have any other hobbies? Well, I'm a father, um, so that's been fun. I have a six-month-old daughter, um, and her name is Harper Rose. And she is um, – it's been uh, it's been a trip. You know, it's, it's funny because <clears throat> most of – the um the guys who I look up to as who are you know the people who I looked up like I said John Sanders um is one of them and and um and another black belt that I've had the uh, f- fortunate opportunity of training with and his name is Bill Cop um both of them amazing Brazilian Jiu Jitsu practitioners type of guys where if you're rolling with them and if they ever really wanted to put it on you and put you in some pain they can and would in, in a heartbeat if they felt that you just, that you needed it to kind of humble you. But both of them have daughters. And so, I mean, as a, you know, as a, as a guy growing up, I mean, the only thing you think about is having, a, having a, uh, a son. And just because, I mean, you're a guy, you know, guy stuff, you know how guys think for the most part. Um, sometimes I question myself, but you know, it, you, you have a better general sense. I mean, having a daughter has really changed my entire perspective on life. And it's just like, you know, I can't wait to introduce her to, you know, my world, but also at the same time, kind of look forward to guiding her the same way that, you know, the, the, the students that come to my class, you know, the way I'm able to guide them, but hopefully, you know, uh, and you know, if I can do a better job, cause sometimes my students, you know, get to yell at me, which is fine. Uh, but yeah, I'm out, and, I, and at the same time, I'm also, I'm also an attorney. And, you know, so that takes up a lot of time and I like to, uh, I like the law. I like the, uh, the idea of the law. Um, and, uh, one, of, I, I, uh, not to constantly throwing quotes out there, but one of my favorite quotes from a movie is, is, is SLC punk. And I don't know if you're familiar with the movie, it's, it's Salt Lake city punk. Um, and the quote is, is the guy is this punk rocker throughout the entire movie and is, you know, anti-establishment you know, all of this, you know, anarchist and all this stuff. And he said he ends up graduating from Harvard law and which he says he cheated all the way through, but it's, um, at the end of the movie he says the best place to take down the establishment is from the inside. And I believe in that. Um, but I, you know, and I think that going to hobbies, I love to travel. My wife and I, um, you know, have an absolute, my, my wife has studied abroad in several different countries. I've been to uh, uh, several different countries myself, but I think, you know, I, I love to travel. And my grandfather, so the last, my last name is Chen, C-H-E-N. And um, my grandfather is originally from Suzhou, China, which is a province outside of Shanghai. Um, and so my dream trip would be to go to China, see, you know, go check out the Buddhist temples, go to Suzhou, check out, um, you know, all the canals and stuff like that. And I'd love to go see, um, go to the forbidden city and, and pref- preferably during a wushu demonstration. Um, and then ultimately end up down in Thailand and, uh, you know, go check out, you know, uh, you know, Thai fights and go see, you know, Phuket and go, you know, I think that tiger Muay Thai, down in, in Phuket puts on the best, um, they do a very good job of, of advertising because man, they like, they make that look awesome. And so that's definitely a place I'd like to travel to. Um, so man, yeah, I mean, as far as, as far as hobby goes, you know, mine's pretty much taken up by, uh, martial arts. If I, if I'm not with my daughter, if I'm not at work, I'm in the gym. I mean, that's just, it's true. I am. I, and I don't, I don't want or need anything else. Right on. You have a full life, for sure. I, I, it's tough to find time to sleep, that's for sure. <laughs> that's how you know you're doing it right. Right, exactly. Life isn't all roses. I think we all know that. Things get tough. And one of the things that seems to be a common thread for martial artists is our ability to lean on our training, the experience we've gained as we go through something difficult in our, let's call it, everyday life. Tell us about a time where things weren't rosy 
and how you were able to lean on your training to get through it. Oh, geez. I mean, there's all kinds of, all kinds of times. I mean, you know, I think specifically, I think one of the toughest times in my life was the, um, when I was transitioning from, uh, got out of college and got out of college at the end of 2008 and, you know, 2008 is, you know, it wasn't a great time, um, e- economic wise. And so I was kind of lost because there wasn't really a job to, you know, be had like, you know, no career, real career path. So I started doing construction, but that's not what I went to college for. So I think that was in, in my, you know, in my life, I think that was the, the toughest time I had. But then I, I started, um, to focus on, you know, a more traditional Western style of sport, which is boxing. And I got into, I started, I was, had been fortunate enough to get a job at a, um, a sport and health club and where they had a former, you know, former boxing coach, former golden gloves winner, you know, guys got multiple golden glove winners under his, you know, under his tutelage. And I started learning from him boxing and you know going through the motions with him and i forgot kind of how much you know when you it's the same thing i talked about before the first time you step on the mats that's the hardest thing you know i didn't know anything about i knew muay thai i knew how to kick and i knew how to punch and put them together but never just boxing so it was an awesome awesome experience and it really it got me through a time where that's what i look forward to i mean when you are kind of, I've never, I've always wanted to, in my mind, the romantic idea of being a wanderer is amazing. But, and then in reality, when you're lost and you don't, and that's not what your goal was to be, is to become lost. It is very scary. And I really turned and I actually, um, you know, started teaching, um, you know, uh, you know, basic, you know, uh, basic arm bars to some of the people that were in the class. And so it just like, it just kept me through. It's just, you know, you go home and you, you remember what you've done. You, you write down and you, and you know, I used to write down, um, different techniques that I had learned and trying to remember during my training when I was in Knoxville. Cause I, at this point I should say I had moved back to Northern Virginia and was, uh, you know, did what every college, uh, college kid's nightmare, which is move back in with your parents. And so, yeah, that was, that was awful. Um, even though I, I love my parents, um, and I loved, I love the fact that they gave me the opportunity to move back. Cause I mean, sometimes that's not an option for some people. And so I'm very fortunate and I don't, I'm not trying to underplay that, but at the same time, you know, I didn't know where I was going. I didn't know what the next step was in my life, but I did know that every day when I woke up, um, I knew what day it was, whether it be, you know, Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, and what classes, um, were available and what I could do, whether it be boxing or I, maybe I'm teaching a little bit of Brazilian Jiu Jitsu or, you know, or there's, you know, I know a couple guys that are going to come in and we'll do a little bit of sparring in a back room. Um, you know, it, it, I knew what day it was and I had that to look forward to. So it's, it's the little things of martial arts that, you know, like you were talking about, that kind of remove you. And that goes back to, you know, my sanctuary is where I am, you know, training, whether it be by myself or with other people, that's my sanctuary. It could be my basement. It could be a seminar gym. It could be, you know, the gym I call home at chaos, um, anywhere. It's just, that is, that's where I get to remove myself for the hour to three hours or even longer. Um, that's where I get to remove myself and I get to be Mike Chen, the martial artist versus Mike Chen, the lost 23 year old, 24 year old kid. So, uh, I said it with a huge smile on my face now. Um, it, but it, it's, uh, if you don't have, if you don't have direction in your life, martial arts definitely provide you direction. I, you know, whether you know it or not, you start there because not everyone is so fortunate enough to just do martial arts as, as a, as a, uh, as a job. Um, I mean, that's just, that's just the reality of it. Not everyone gets to be 
this, uh, like I said, the wanderer um, that you see that's romanticized in so many um, martial arts uh, movies that I've watched over the years where, you know, there, there's this mysterious guy who shows up in a town and there, his, his wushu is, is, uh, is challenged by others that are in the town. I mean, there's just, it, it just isn't that way anymore. So, I mean, like, uh, you know, you got accountants and lawyers and doctors and trash men and, you know, uh, you know, whatever car, you know, kind of like what you, what you saw in, in fight club. I mean, um, you know, your people who are, are servers, it just, you know, all walks of life and you really get to meet all these people and you start to learn a lot about yourself, just getting to know your training partners. And I, I, I think I did that. I, I, both at every stage of my martial arts career, I, I got to learn a lot about myself through others and, you know, what it takes to either be successful or whatever your own definition of success is, you know? Um, and I've, I've been fortunate enough to get where I am, um, simply because, you know, people kept putting ideas in my head and, you know, why don't you try this and why don't you do this? And it gave me direction. And, uh, I've been very fortunate in life simply because of martial arts. I, I mean, I'm not going to go as far to be cliche and say martial arts saved my life because, I mean, I probably would have survived anyway. But, I mean, the happiness that I feel, like I said, as I say all of this with a smile on my face, the happiness and, as you aptly said, the, f- the, the full life that I live, I owe all to martial arts, 100%. Deep stuff. I hope not too deep. I mean, no. I'm trying to laugh. I'm trying no, to laugh. No, no, no. It's you're you're taking us. One of the things I'm I'm kind of seeing here is, as you talk, you take us through a lot of emotional transition. At least for me, you know, I'm I'm hearing the shifts and uh, progress, if I can call it that, movement forward, growth in all of your stories, and that's inspiring. And I hope the listeners are feeling the same way. <laughs> You've had the chance to do a bunch of different stuff in martial arts, to train with different people. If you had to pick the one person who was the most influential in your martial arts upbringing, who would that be? I think as a martial artist, I think that, you know, obviously I give a lot of, I give a lot of, uh, do, um, do props to Dustin, my roommate, Dustin Fulton, um, for getting me into it. But I think that, you know, I learned from so many people, but I, as I said before, I don't think I, I've grown so much as I have since I moved to, you know, moved up here to New Hampshire and started learning under John Sanders and also Tony McBee. I mean, these guys have taught me so much. I mean, it's it's become so much more than just a, a student teacher um, relationship. It's these guys are my friends. These guys. You know, uh, you know, I've been to my house. They've been, you know, they. It's, I, and I can't say enough. I mean, to to know that you have this person who is taking the time, and you know, and this is something that both both John and Tony do very well, is that they will pull you aside or or, or focus on you, and make that eye contact and, and make you feel that they're there for you. I've developed so much. And then also, like I said, I mean, I, I've been fortunate enough to, to, uh, been asked to coach and, um, and the Muay Thai program that we have. And I try to do the same thing. And I, I, I've grown as a human being, as a person, as a man, um, just being with them, being around them. I mean, geez, I, I went from, you know, um, I mean, I, I've been doing martial arts, for 11 years now i mean i obviously as you said in the grand scheme of things it's not that long but i feel like i've been doing it forever just simply because of how much knowledge you start to you know sap off of these folks um you know you have like john i think put it very very poignantly one day he goes yes you you have this knowledge and he was talking about another person in the uh in the gym he was talking to me specifically. He said, you know, these, these guys have a lot of knowledge, of course. He goes, but in, I've been doing this for 25 years. My knowledge goes much deeper. And that, you know, and that's kind of where, why you seek that, you know, that older or the, the, the construct of, 
the uh, the martial artist who is a little bit older, who's been doing a little bit longer, that you can that they have a deeper understanding. It's not just the technique, but the but the purpose behind the technique, the uh, the focus behind the technique, the what it takes to have developed that technique in whatever martial arts. I mean, it's 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 awesome. And I, and I would be remiss if I didn't say that. I would say one of the biggest driving forces in my life in my martial arts career um, has been my wife, Julie, because when we first met, um, I would force her and I would drag her to all the UFC events um, that were in Phoenix, Arizona, um, go watch them at local bars. And it was actually kind of nice on the, on the, when it's on the West Coast time, as opposed to starting at 10 p.m., they start at 7 p.m. So you can actually watch it and get a good night's sleep on a Saturday. Um, but she would willingly go to all these things. And then when I would go and like both of us were in law school at that point, she's also an attorney. Um, you know, she would, she would allow me to go train at Gracie, Arizona. I, I would go in the morning before I would go to class. I would go, um, and uh, like, are you trained with a, a real good friend of mine and give him a big shout out, Connor waffle. Um, he is a Brown belt now. He's an amazing human being. Um, but he, uh, but I would get the chance to go train in the morning and then at night. I mean, I was training four hours a day sometimes, and she has done nothing but when you come home, how is training? Big smile on her face. And the poor woman has been dragged all over the place to go to these different uh, Brazilian jiu-jitsu competitions. I mean, I've done the Vermont Open several times. I've competed in Boston at the most recent Boston Open. I mean. And she understands now that when you go to these competitions, that you go as a spectator and you sit and you sit for hours and hours on end until they actually start. Um, and so, but she does it with a smile on her face. And, and I, I, she's the one that encourages me to train. She's the one that and tells me every day, you know, uh, you know, how's it going? You know, why don't you, like if I, I recently had an injury in my hip and I was out for three weeks and she's just like, God, she's like, I can't wait for you to go back to training. You are so annoying. Get out of here. Um, but it, it's, it's, I mean, she's, she's a, she is the support system that every martial arts artist needs. I mean, if you are lucky enough and fortunate enough to find a partner, um, you know, guy or girl, it doesn't matter, um, that supports your martial arts or is even willing. She, had, she at one point was willing to be a student, and be my guinea pig for uh, different Muay Thai techniques. Um, she is, uh, she, I wouldn't say it's 100% willingly, but she did it. Um, it was, um, it, it's, it's, it's someone you just don't let go. I mean, they, I, that sounds kind of corny, but yeah, I just, I couldn't imagine. Because uh, you know, obviously, if I had to choose between martial arts and my wife, well, I mean, I guess I can't really answer that question. Cause I'm sure she's going to listen to this, but I, I, but I love my wife more than anything in this world. And I, and one of the biggest perks of this, of this woman who I've married and chose to spend the rest of my life with is that she supports my martial arts and my, I would say it's less of a hobby, more of an obsession. So. Well, big shout out to your wife, because I think some of us right. have experienced training with an unsupportive partner and it, doesn't tend to work very long <laughs> it doesn't it does not and I, I love all those memes you see on facebook of uh you know obviously my facebook is filled with you know like muay thai addict muay thai guy um who i love and uh and then brazilian you know all kinds of different brazilian jiu-jitsu stuff mma you know different podcasts and you see the same meme over and over again where it's you know the um is like you know where were you where were you from you know the significant other and it's like uh, you know, where have you been for the past two, three hours? And it's like, wow, I've just been training. And, you know, I, I just, you know, it, it's, it's so true. Cause I mean, if you, if you really have any real love of what you do and as a martial arts, I mean, again, I, I, I can only talk from personal experience. I've only done Brazilian Jiu Jitsu and Muay Thai and, you know, some boxing that, you know, I can't talk about, you know, I don't know anything really about karate or Taekwondo, but I mean, it takes up a, a substantial portion of your day. I mean, I know there are some, you know, Monday, you know, I all train for two, three hours a night. Yeah. And so, I mean, it, it takes up a lot of time and, sure does. um, and it, it's, uh, yeah, I mean, I could see, 
that if you're not into it or if your significant other's not into it, it's tough. It is definitely tough. So I am very lucky. I'm very fortunate in life. Cool. Well, shout out to your wife and thank you to her. Do you have a favorite martial arts movie? Do I have a favorite? I, I, I do. I, I, at one point, um, at one point, so my favorite martial, I, I, I think that it goes specifically to the actor. So Jet Li is probably my favorite martial arts actor. At one point, um, I had seen, um, cause I, again, I'm from a town of 500. So there isn't really a whole lot to do when you're from a town of, of town of 500. Um, um, uh, at one point, I had seen every single Jet Li movie, whether English, um, in English, dubbed for English, or strictly in um, strictly in subtitles. I saw them all. I love Jet Li as an actor, um, and I think that. But that being said, um, I guess I should. I'm looking at what I had written down uh, in preparation for today. I I would say that. Jet Li, as far as, you know, his traditional martial arts of wushu and watching him, you know, do uh, what he does. On, I mean, gosh, I mean, even to Expendables 3, I mean, the guy's incredible. But uh, Once Upon a Time in China, um, and the reason, and 1, 2, and 3, that's, uh, he plays the character of Wong Fei Hong, um, which is, uh, he's a folk, um, he's a folk hero, but also a traditional mar- martial artist. I mean, it's... Uh, uh, a wushu practitioner back in the mid 1800s in, in, in China. And, you know, having my grandfather, um, be from China, I always connected with those movies. I always thought, Oh man, you know, well, what it would have been like if I were born there? Like, you know, is, is this what it, what it would have looked like? Is this how I would have been? And it just, it took something, it, it was a little bit more, it was a little bit deeper, um, than you know, uh, than just watching uh, an actor, you know, perform all these incredible, um, these all these incredible techniques. But um, yeah, I, I remember those uh, you're watching all of those movies, especially you know, Once Upon a Time in China. I think is if anybody is interested, it's kind of like the Ip, Ip Man series um, with uh, Danny um, Danny Yen. Um, that, you know, you have this person who through his martial arts is standing up for what, he, what is a traditional, um, way of life and sticking up for, um, you know, kind of the, the smaller person and being the protector of an area. Um, and, uh, I, I always, I always really, really got into it, but if I can put the number one martial arts movie of all time in my mind, all time, hands down. It's got to be Surf Ninjas. <laughs> Surf Ninjas is the greatest martial arts movies of all, all time, and it, I mean, you know, it has, you know, um, it has an, an incredible martial arts in Ernie Reyes Jr. I mean, if you've ever seen that guy, I mean, yeah. he's incredible. He's I mean, the he's real inc- deal. He, he is he is the real real deal. But I mean, that movie was so great. He had Rob Schneider, Leslie Nielsen, um, and it, just the story is 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 basically my fantasy in life. Was that you know my grandfather was some you know uh, you know some king in some small island nation in in in, uh, in Asia, um, and and Patusan is the name of the island if I remember that correctly Patusan, and that you know I was somehow had some uh, some you know because that movie came out in ninety three I think so That's I was right. yeah so I was about eight nine years old at that point so i was i mean your imagination as a kid's running wild so i was like oh that could be me um but that also gave one of the greatest quotes of all time to this world which is money can't buy knives and uh it's true money can't buy knives i mean it could buy anything else except for knives and i love that and i mean if you watch it it's 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 I, i don't know if you haven't seen surf ninjas go out rent that i guess well i guess can't rent movies anymore but if you Netflix, download it, Amazon, I don't care. Go watch that movie. It's worth owning, worth living your life by. Um, absolutely. So that's my favorite movie. Okay. How about books? Are you at all a reader? I do read. I read a lot. So, um, but I don't read for pleasure. I read for work. So, okay. so I, I turn. I, I'm a I'm a visual guy. Once I get home. Got it. No more shorts books. That's okay. No, no. I think that, well, I mean, the books that I've read have pretty much been philosophical and, 
religious in nature. Yeah. Um, but no, as far as martial arts book, I haven't I haven't had the opportunity to uh, to read any books unless unless you count um, the Rock says by the Rock. Um, <laughs> <laughs> All right, goals. You're still training. You're still working hard. You're you know you're you're in the gym a couple hours a night. You said. Oh yeah. Why? What are you working towards? Ultimately, what I'm working towards is to be the best version of myself and be the best martial artist that I can be and to keep learning. I think that's one of the greatest parts of martial arts in general. And again, this goes I think this goes across the gamut, but I can speak specifically about Brazilian Jiu Jitsu and Muay Thai is that you there is there is specifically Brazilian Jiu Jitsu. And they say that Brazilian Jiu Jitsu techniques aren't um, aren't made. They're discovered. And I love that concept. I love that idea of Brazilian Jiu-Jitsu is is a discovery process. And, you know, and I, I love how week in, week out, training session, training session out, uh, that I discover something new, that I, that I have that light bulb go off. And I think there's no better feeling of, of than having that light bulb go off and be like, oh, I get this now. And I, I think that that's so, so awesome to have. And I hope that, I mean, if you look at, you know, Helio Gracie, you know, Halson Gracie, you know, Carlson until, until the day he died. I mean, these guys were training. These guys were doing it. You know, uh, like Helio, I mean, he trained well into his 80s and 90s. I mean, the guy was an incredible. And I would love that. I mean, you know, shoot, I'm, you're talking 60 more years of training. I mean, that's fantastic. I mean, obviously, from a selfish standpoint, and you know, if you want to put it, um, you know, put it on like a belt level or you know something that's you know tangible, I'd love to get my black belt in Brazilian Jiu Jitsu. But it, you know, at the end of the day, it's not exactly my goal. I, I think it's to discover more of myself and my own uh, Brazilian Jiu Jitsu game and Muay Thai game. I mean, you know, you just you learn so much about yourself every time you train. I mean, there are people that's kind of the whole idea of the two sides of the family for uh, Gracie is that, you know, you had Carlson, who is famous for pressure, you know, being on top, pressure passing, pressure, always pressuring someone and, uh, you know, versus kind of or if you take it from a new school approach, if you look at some of the stuff that Eddie Bravo does, who's an, an incredible Brazilian Jiu Jitsu practitioner and, and has come up with his own style. I mean, you, every single person that you see, I mean, um, it, their, their styles are different. I mean, and you see that in MMA, you see that in karate, you see that, you know, if you, if you, everything's different, everything's different. Everyone has their own take on martial arts. And I just, I, I'm, I get excited every time I think about it because I know that where I'm, where, you know, okay, 20 years from now, where am I going to be in this, in this, in this path? Am I even going to, you know, like, am I going to have progressed? Am I, am I going to have regress? Because, I mean, that happens. I mean, sometimes that'll happen. I mean, it's, sometimes you have to take a couple steps back to go forward. And I think that in, in, in Brazilian Jiu-Jitsu, I, I've, I've definitely learned that. Where you start getting to, um, like, for example, um, you know, in Brazilian Jiu-Jitsu, there are so an infinite, almost an infinite number of techniques and, that you can learn, that you can do. And... You see, like for example, um, you know, you see the advent of certain, um, certain new, um, newish. I put that in quotation marks. Um, that uh, new techniques that have kind of all the rage, like for example, the barambolo, um, which is a back take, um, or you know, the worm guard that you've seen that has kind of kind of come about. You know, it, people see that and they're like, oh, wow, this is flashy. This is awesome. And it's just like, OK, you, you, you learn it. But then, you know, when you try to incorporate it in your game, it doesn't help. So you go back to you're like, OK, what did I do as a white belt? How do I do the low pass? How do I do stuff that I learned day seven, day 10 as as a white belt? And how do I do that so well that no one can stop it? And I, I just I, I love that idea of in, in my martial arts journey just across the board. And I and I can't wait to share it with my children um, and the people who I train with and the people who come to the school and as a coach. I mean, as a coach, you have that you are given this incredible gift by your students that they're willing to come and listen to you 
and take what you have to say and say, okay, I'm going to try that. I'm going to do that. And you get to see that and you get to see them grow. And, you know, you hope for the best that, that, you know, what you're saying is, is going to help them or what you're saying is, is even beneficial to them. You know, I, I, I'd like to think that every time I walk in, but it's just something that's such an incredible gift. And I, I hope to continue to train, to compete, to, you know, essentially learn. I mean, learning is, is the, the, the greatest part of martial arts is, is to learn. And, uh, I, I, I hope that that's, uh, that's my martial arts goal is to continue to learn. If I put it in, in one word, learn, continue to learn. So, but I, I'd love to have a black belt in Brazilian jiu-jitsu, jiu-jitsu, but I've also, I'd also love to have a million dollars, but you know, you, you get, you get things when they come to you. And, uh, and I think that that's special about Brazilian jiu-jitsu is that you, your belt is only to tie your gi. It's not who you are as a Brazilian jiu-jitsu practitioner. And I think the people who define themselves as their belt, kind of miss out on the point does that make sense it does it's a it's something that we've heard repeated on this show over and over and hopefully we're we're starting to make some impact on that field yeah yeah so we've had some great conversation today and if anybody out there wants to reach out to you or know more about you or anything like that how would they do that are there are there websites or ways that people can contact you Absolutely. So we, uh, we're at chaos NH. Um, I've, I've sent you or the, um, see specific. So you can find us on Facebook, chaos martial arts, um, and chaos NH.com. And if you want to talk to me specifically, um, uh, hang on. Um, uh, it's info at chaos. Oh, no, it's not. Excuse me. Sorry. <laughs> quite all right hang on, hang on one second info dot chaos nh at gmail.com um i'd love to talk to anybody who wants to talk about martial arts i want to talk to anybody who wants to you know come check us out and i'm, I'm willing to sit down with anybody because you know what's funny is that um and, and not to take up too much time is uh um i have been lucky enough to meet um uh several people in my life um with regards to martial arts, but I think the people who are most receptive to sitting down and talking to you are martial artists because I mean, in a professional standpoint, when, you know, in any professional standpoint, where it doesn't matter what you do, if you're trying to network, some people aren't as willing to do that. Some people just don't want to talk to you. And I think that if you, if you talk to anybody who's really been around in and around martial arts or mixed martial arts or whatever, in this in this quote unquote game, that if you reach out to them, they're oh my, they're so happy to talk to you about it. And so I've met several people who I've never met in my life before, reaching out to them through Facebook and saying, "Hey, let's sit down, and we'll go out to lunch." And then you become friends, and you just you have that contact for life, and it's been really cool. I I can't say it. I, I yeah. Um, if you guys ever want, if anybody ever wants to talk to me. Or come in and meet meet us. We're at 89 Fort Eddy Road in um, in Concord. Come in, um, check out the website, email me. Facebook always works. We uh, so yeah, I'm happy to talk right. to anybody. Cool, and of course we'll link all that stuff over on the show notes. Whistlekickmartialartsradio.com in case anybody's new. Let's wind it up. What parting advice do you have for the people listening? I think that if you if you're starting out in martial arts, know that everyone put on the same white belt that you did and things do get better. You do learn as long as you stick with it. It's just like anything in life. If you're not willing to put the time and effort in, you know, it, it's you're not going to reap the rewards that you possibly could. Um, but and if any any uh, if my one biggest piece of advice for any martial artist listening is listen to your body because as as I want to as I saw the other day once you hit 30 years old there are no longer injuries there are permanent disabilities so listen to your body give yourself time to heal i know that i i learned that the hard way several times it's hard not to feel excited about training after listening to coach chen we're planning to meet up soon and i really do hope that happens he seems like a good person to be around thank you coach chen for coming on the show today 
over at whistlekickmartialartsradio.com. You can find the show notes with some photos of Coach Chen doing what he loves, as well as links and other stuff we talked about. You can follow us on social media too. Facebook, Twitter, Pinterest, YouTube, and Instagram. Our username is Whistlekick. You should also check out the Facebook group, Whistlekick Martial Arts Radio, behind the scenes. Hopefully, you're helping us spread the word about the show, whether that be messaging links to your martial arts friends or taping them to a chair and putting headphones on them. Whatever method you choose is entirely up to you, and I'm not suggesting you force people to listen. (laughs) Visit martialartscalendar.com and help us make sure all the events you know of are listed there. It's an important website, and it's one that we've put a lot of resources into. Help us make it the best it can be. Thanks for listening today. Until next time, train hard, smile, have a great day.